my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and later this month in May of 2020, there's going to be a movie coming out starring Dev Patel, Sean Harris, and a few other people, most of whom I'm not terribly familiar with, actually. And at this point, you're probably wondering, wait a minute, there's no Lord of the Rings movie or anything coming out in the next, you know, with Dev Patel of all people. No, there's not. Uh, but there is a movie about the Green Knight coming out, and <clears throat> Tolkien wrote about the Green Knight. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, specifically. Gawain, not Gawain, because this is in Middle English, and if you actually read the thing, you can tell that the emphasis is on the G and not the W, because it's in alliterative poetry from Middle English, back around the time of Chaucer, in fact. And I'm going to talk about the poem itself in this video, in preparation, sort of, not really in preparation for the movie, but it seems like a good time to do it, since the movie's coming out. So, let's talk about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So as far as the source, this is Sir Gawain, Pearl, and Sir Orfeo. It's three different poems published in the same book by Christopher Tolkien after J.R.R. Tolkien's death. And Tolkien had originally worked on a scholarly edition of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight with E.V. Gordon, who you know, he also worked on Pearl with, but he never really finished the project on Pearl. But all three poems are kind of from the same era, and he did, you know, kind of finish his version of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, but this was published in the original Middle English with scholarly notes and all that. It was a scholar's edition. He later published, or not published, but wrote the modern English version, which is contained in the book that I have, and which is pretty readily available. You can get it pretty easily anywhere. And that's, you know, the one that I've read because I don't know Middle English. So the poem itself is, the plot is pretty simple, but the poem is really interesting in, term of, in terms of its verse form. It is rather unusual in that it is alliterative poetry, which if you're not familiar, it's like an old English form of poetry, which can be, it, there's no real rhyme scheme to it generally, but there's usually, it, there's patterns to the, the emphasis that always end up falling on the same consonant sound. And it's the same stressed consonant sound, and that's why I said earlier, you could tell it's Gawain in this poem and not Gawain, because the emphasis is always on the G. So you can get a pretty good feel for it just by reading some of the lines. And so let me read a couple here, find a good one. The fifth five that was used as I find by this knight was free giving and friendliness first before all, and chastity and chivalry ever changeless and straight. So there you can hear those, you know, the F, 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 and then the ch, 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 although I pronounced the chivalry like ch, so maybe that should have been a ch as well. At any rate, that's most of the poem, but it's interesting because each stanza has multiple lines of the alliterative, alliterative verse, and then it ends with like a two or three beat foot, which then begins a rhyme scheme, and it goes A, B, A, B, A. And so an example of that would be, you get a, an alliterative line, for all sakes that men swear by conceal, for all sakes that men, cons for all sakes that men swear by, conceal not the truth in guile, the knight said by St. John, and softly gave a smile, Nay, lover have I none, and none will have meanwhile. So you get these really short lines at the end of each large body of alliterative verse. And so it's a really interesting poem because it combines this alliterative style with these little short rhyming lines, which is really unusual. I mean, if you want more examples of the alliterative form, you could try Beowulf, you could try uh, Tolkien's own poem for the children of Hurin, uh, his Fall of Arthur, he did uh, on with alliterative verse, so you could get other forms of it there, but that's kind of the poetic style. Uh, the history, as I mentioned, the, the author of the poem, whose name is not known, uh, was apparently a contemporary of Chaucer, but nowhere near as famous at this stage in history as, as Chaucer now is. So that's kind of what I know about the poem, more I'm sure could be said by scholars of, of the, the period and, and this literature, 
Um, and of course, like I said, there's two other poems in this book, one of which I believe is also by the same poet, the other I'm not so sure. Um, but they're, you know, all three of these poems are definitely worth reading, but of course I'm focusing on Sir Gawain and the Green Knight because that's the movie that's coming out. So, now let's talk about the plot. So the plot is actually pretty simple, uh, but it contains some interesting elements to it. We begin with King Arthur in Camelot celebrating the Christmas season, and on New Year's Day, while everybody's celebrating, we get an interesting character arrive. We've got this green, and I mean green all over, knight on a green horse, uh, basically just rides into the middle of the court, and the guy is huge, has this big bushy beard, bushy maybe a pun, I'm not sure. I don't think it actually uses that word in the in the text itself, but that's the idea you get, and it kind of makes sense. And he basically, Arthur welcomes him in. Nobody really knows who he is, but he's carrying this huge axe, too. Arthur welcomes him in, and he basically says, you know, I'm looking for a game this Christmas season. And Arthur is like, okay, keep going. And the Green Knight basically says, any one of you can take my axe and whack at my head, and then I get to return the blow after, which seems like a really strange game to play especially at Christmas. At any rate, everybody at first is like, mm, there's something fishy about this, we're not going to move, and then the Green Knight starts taunting them, basically saying, I thought you all were supposed to be a bunch of really brave knights, the bravest that ever were. And Arthur, of course, gets his blood boiling at this and basically says, okay, fine, I'll do it. And so he gets ready, and then just before he's about to really get into it, Gawain steps up and says, I'm going to claim this. You shouldn't do it. I am the least of all the knights here, and so it won't be a big deal if I die. And here we already get one of the themes going of this story, which is Gawain is ridiculously self-effacing and, and humble to the point of, it's almost ridiculous how humble he is. He always puts himself way down. But everybody else in the poem is going to basically say that Gawain is one of the best of the knights because he is the most courteous and the most whatever. So this is one of the running themes of the story. At any rate, Arthur does let Gawain take his place. Gawain takes the axe, and sure enough, he will wax the Green Knight's head off. Green Knight, however, just walks over and picks up his own head and basically says, All right, one year from now, you got to find me at the Green Chapel and then I get to return the, the, the blow. And they're all like, well, where's the green chapel? <laughs> so anyway, the year passes, and then Gawain has to go find it. So he sets out several days beforehand and starts wandering around and apparently has several adventures on the way, which the author kind of is like, you know, he did all this stuff, and I'm not going to talk about that because that's kind of beside the point, and it would take too long. And then he's out there in the freezing cold because again it's you know at the end of the year and this is in Britain of course so it's really cold and he's wandering and can't find where the Green Chapel is though he asks lots of people you know if you heard of the Green Chapel nope uh, and he keeps wandering around and then as he's approaching Christmas Day itself it's on Christmas Eve and he basically prays that he'll be able to find lodging where he'll be able to attend Mass for Christmas so shortly after he does that, he sees a castle in the woods. And he's like, well, thank goodness, I actually found a place. And he goes to the castle and he basically says, you know, tells the, the person at the gate, you know, I'm looking for a place to stay, and they let him in. So after he's admitted into the castle, he meets the lord of the castle, whom, oddly enough, we don't get the name of. They don't actually introduce each, well, Gawain introduces himself, but the lord of the castle doesn't introduce himself at all, um, but he's he's this large, jovial character, and he's you get the idea that he's always having fun, uh, and he welcomes him in, and then they, you know, they go to Christmas Eve Mass together, and after the Christmas Eve Mass, he comes out and he sees that the lady of the castle, who he finds to be more beautiful even than Guinevere, which, you know, if you know your Arthurian legend, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, and she is accompanied by this really old, 
crusty old hag of a woman. <laughs> uh, uh, and basically the lord of the castle basically says, well, that's my wife. And, you know, I don't even think he identifies the older woman. But Gawain, Gawain goes up and greets them and, you know, courteous to both, of course, but he's, you could tell he's finding a little more pleasure in the company of the lady than the, than the older woman. Uh, and anyway, over the course of the Christmas season, he spends a lot of time with both ladies because they're pretty much always together. And as it approaches New Year's, he begins to, you know, get ready to go again. And he tells the Lord of the castle, look, I've got to go, you know, and the, the Lord of the castle's like, no, stay. This is, you know, we're really happy to have you here. And he says, well, I've got to be at the Green Chapel on New Year's to meet with, you know, to, to do something. And the Lord of the Castle's like, well, you're in luck. It's only two miles away, and I can have you guided there on New Year's. So now you have to stay. And so Galway is like, okay, fine. <laughs> because he doesn't really want to set out any earlier than he has to anyway. So at the end of this particular day, he ends up, uh, the Lord of the Castle basically says, I have a Christmas game for you. And of course, the astute reader is going, this doesn't sound good. Uh, but his game is essentially, you know, I'm going to be hunting in the morning and whatever I win in my hunt, I will give you at the end of the day. If you give me whatever you can by your skill and your, and your, you know, your cunning win in my castle while you spend the day here at the end of the day. And so Galway says, Sure, sounds good to me. Uh, and, and that's another theme in this story, too, is Gawain is pretty much always willing to go along with whatever is proposed, and he's the perfectly courteous person. Um, and so they all go to bed that night, and then the Lord is up bright and early out hunting, and he's hunting stags in this particular case. And we get a description of the hunt, and then we go back to Gawain, who is kind of in bed a little bit late. And he, and while he's laying in bed, hears a noise at his door, and he sees the lady of the castle come in. So he kind of pretends to be asleep, and then the lady just comes and sits down on his bed. And of course, he's a little bit uncomfortable, and he kind of waits there a little while, but she's not moving, and so he pretends to wake up, and then... You know, she kind of gently mocks him for being in bed so late and whatnot. And as they just kind of keep talking, he basically, she basically kind of keeps him in bed for a good while. And you get the distinct impression that she is trying to seduce him. And he courteously kind of puts her off multiple times, and they have a lot of back and forth. And finally, she's about to leave, but then kisses him. And then she leaves, he gets up, goes to morning mass, spends the day with, you know, the lady and the old woman. And then at the end of the day, we get a little bit more of a description of the hunt. And the, oddly enough, we get kind of a large description of the, the way that they end up carving up the, the stags that they hunt down. Um, and then the Lord returns, of course, and the Lord basically shows off you know, the, the prizes of his hunt and Gawain says, well, here's what I got. And he takes him and he kisses him, which of course is not super weird because back then everybody could kiss anybody and it was not considered abnormal. It was a typical type of greeting. So there wasn't necessarily anything weird in that for him to necessarily be suspicious. And so they've exchanged their winnings. Gawain, of course, came out way the better. So at the end of the day, the Lord basically proposes, well, let's do it again tomorrow. And Gawain, of course, being the courteous knight that he is, says, okay, fine. And then we have kind of a repetition of the same thing. The, the Lord ends up getting early, getting up early to hunt, and this time he's hunting a boar, a really big, nasty one that keeps scattering his dogs and his, his men. Gawain, of course, is awakened by the lady again. And this time, the same thing more or less happens. She keeps him in bed for a while and, again, has the the repartee where she's kind of trying to make a move and he's kind of putting her off. And this time, though, she ends up kissing him twice. So she eventually leaves. 
he gets up, goes to morning mass, and eventually they, you know, spend the day in the castle doing not much of anything. The Lord ends up returning with his boar, after we get a little bit more description of that adventure, and when he brings the boar to Gawain, Gawain now gives him two kisses. And, of course, the Lord in all of this is kind of making the joke that, you are you know, you're doing great. I don't know what you're doing, but you're you're getting some really great stuff here, which makes you wonder if he knows where he's getting these kisses from. But at any rate, at the end of the day, guess what? The Lord decides, hey, let's do it again. And Gawain says, I really have to go. And because at this point, he's kind of getting uncomfortable with what the lady's doing every morning. But the Lord basically presses him and says, look, the Green Chapel's just right nearby. There's no reason you have to leave now. Stick around. We'll do it, you know, one more day. And then I'll have somebody guide you to where the Green Chapel is. And Gawain's like, okay, fine. So they wake up the next day and the Lord gets up bright and early as usual. And this time he's hunting a fox. And so, the you know, you could kind of tell the progression. He's got a lot of really good deer meat the first day. And then he kills this really nasty boar, which is still kind of cool. But now he's just hunting a little bit little bitty fox and so it's kind of his progression is kind of going downward uh, but at least nobody's getting hurt this time <laughs> uh, Gawain of course is in the same position as he was the first two days the lady comes in before he gets up kind of keeps him in bed but this time she gets so open about her intentions that he is more or less forced to basically say look cut it out I am <laughs> this is not okay and she ends up kind of taking offense, basically, like, I can't believe you would turn me down. Surely, you know, you must have a, you know, a, a paramour of your own or something. And Gawain's like, no, I don't have anybody like that in my life, actually. And she's, she seems kind of crushed by this because it's like, then how could you possibly turn me down? Um, and she's, she basically ends up saying, well, if you won't do that, then give me a, you know, a glove or something to remember you by, and Gawain basically says, I don't really have anything with me. Um, and then she says, well, I'll at least give you something. And in the course of all this, she's already kissed him twice, I think. Um, and But she offers to give him her girdle, which is kind of green and gold, and basically says, you know, I'll, I'll give you this, even if you can't give me anything. And he's like, no, I'm not going to take anything of yours. And she says, well, you know, you might say that now, but if you knew more about it, you might want it. And basically she says that anybody who has this, you know, tied around them will not be able to be harmed by, a, a, you know, basically a, a cunning of hands. So basically, like, nobody can hurt you by attacking you. And Gawain's like, that might be useful. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, and... Then she ends up giving him a third kiss and finally leaving. So after all of this passes, he gets up, goes to his morning mass, and he, you know, does his daily thing. And then the, again, there's a lot of staring back and forth between him and the lady at dinner, and it's awkward and whatever. But the Lord finally arrives, gives him the fox, and Gawain gives him the three kisses, but he doesn't say anything about the belt. So... That, of course, is going to become important later on. Anyway, the, the Lord basically, you know, says, all right, we're done tomorrow. You know, I'll make sure that somebody guides you to the Green Chapel. So Gawain gets up. This time it's his turn to get up early. And you get the idea that the Lord is not up because he doesn't encounter him at all. He gets all of his armor on, you know, gets, his, gets on his horse and gets ready to go. And he's thanking all the members of the household. But the Lord isn't even mentioned. So it's like he finally decided to sleep in or something. Well, he ends up, you know, going off with a guide towards the Green Chapel. And in the woods, the guide he has at one point stops, basically says, I'm not going any farther, dude. You're on your own after this point. And if you ask me, you wouldn't go there because this guy is mean. There's a, there's a dude down there that kills basically anybody that passes through. So, you know, just turn back now. I won't tell anybody you know, that you were a coward or anything, and Gawain's like, no, I'm not going to turn back and be a coward. Thanks for looking out for me, but I have a, I have to go down here because I made a promise to. 
So the guy basically hightails it kind of at this point, assuming that Gawain must be nuts. And Gawain goes down, and he doesn't see anything that resembles a chapel, just a barrow off the side of the road. And he goes in there, and he doesn't really see anything, but then all of a sudden he hears this tremendous tremendous grinding noise, and, you know, like the grinding of an axe. And he hears, you know, he shouts out, you know, trying to figure out who's there, and he hears a voice coming back basically saying, hang on a minute, I'll be there. And the Green Knight comes out of this cave sort of and you know carrying his axe and they have a little bit of a back and forth basically saying all right you well you came like you said you would good for you and Gawain takes off his helmet gets ready and he you know kneels down for the green knight to take his hack at him and at first the the green knight takes like a faint blow he, he doesn't actually hit him he just pretends like he's going to and Gawain flinches as any one you know probably would and the green knight taunts him basically saying and here i thought you were some brave knight and you're just a coward you're flinching i didn't flinch whenever you attacked me and gawain basically says you know i'm gonna lose my head i can't pick it back up but i'm not gonna flinch again so you know he puts his head down again the green knight takes another feint and this time you know says ah now you're ready and you know kind of goes on a uh little bit of a soliloquy and Gawain's like would you just give it get it over with just do the thing and get it done and so he's like okay fine so he swings but this time he only nicks his neck he doesn't actually chop the whole head off and immediately Gawain grabs his helmet puts it back on and he gets ready in a fighting position basically says okay you've had your hit now if you want to do more you're gonna have to pay for him and the green knight says chill man i'm not trying to get you 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 got what you came for you know you've paid with you know you've met your agreement we're all good and then he goes off into this explanation of you know the first two feints were because of the first two days where you gave everything that you were supposed to at the end of the day but the third day you kind of held back on me you didn't give me the girdle and so now the reader realizes the green knight is the lord of the castle and he ends up explaining i put my wife up to doing all that stuff to you to test you and you came through with flying colors you just lacked a little bit of loyalty though i don't blame you too much because you were trying to save your own life gawain then basically in utter shame at the fact that he you know lied about the girdle and all that accuses himself of cowardice and covetousness and basically says man i'm I'm a horrible person. And the the other guy says, ah, it's not that bad. And then he also further explains the old lady who was with his wife um, was actually Morgan Le Fay who put a spell on him, which is why he went to King Arthur's court in the first place. He invites him back to the castle to stay for a while, and Gawain says, no, I'm, I've been here long enough. Oh, and we also get the Green Knight's actual name. He names himself Sir Bertilac de Haute Desert. I'm not really sure I'm pronoun pronouncing that right, so don't don't crucify me if I'm not. <laughs> uh, it must be French, so it's Haute Desert or something like that. But at any rate, um, he says, you know, you can... At first, Gawain, Gawain throws down the girdle, and, and the Green Knight says, look, you can keep that. And Gawain's like, you know what, I will keep it, basically as a reminder of my own failing in this instance. So anyway, he sets off back to Camelot, and on his way he has a whole bunch more adventures that the author says I'm not going to get into all the details of. He eventually makes it back, tells them about everything, and he's wearing the, the girdle basically as a baldric, which is um, just a, a belt that you would wear like a cross, which you could hang a sword from or something. Um, and everybody when they hear the story he ends up explaining you know why he's wearing this girdle and basically says i'm going to wear this forever to remind me of my own terrible failing and arthur kind of blows it off you know basically like that's not really that big of a deal and he also arthur in in kind of recognition of what going has done he basically says from now on all the knights of the round table will wear 
a green baldric like that, and it becomes a mark of, you know, the fact that you were a member of the round table. So, you know, it, 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 the, the whole theme basically being kind of at the end, Gawain is courteous and he's really good at chivalry and all this other stuff, but he realizes at the end, there are some things that are slightly more important than the courtly, you know, uh, virtues, so to speak. And uh, that's pretty much the end of the story. So that's the plot of it. And the it's really interesting to read through because you, you get all this back and forth. And it's the back and forth that you get that's really interesting because you can see Gawain putting himself down and other people praising him and all this stuff. Another handy thing I should have mentioned too about the book itself, in the back there is a glossary, which is really handy because there's a lot of words in this poem that even though it's not in the Middle English, most readers won't recognize. And so there's a glossary at the back to explain a lot of those, which is how I know what a baldric is, <laughs> because that's what the, the glossary actually explains that, and there's a whole bunch of others. So anyway, that is the story of Gawain and the Green Knight. So, hope you enjoyed that video. Hope you uh, learned a little bit of something there about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. There have been many adaptations of this, and I've seen a really old one where Sean Connery plays the Green Knight. It's kind of horrible. <laughs> um, but the one that's coming up looks like it's going to go a really different route. And I'm curious to see it, although I probably won't see it for a while just because of circumstances. But I will look forward to seeing it and hopefully this will give you all some idea of what to look for and what to pay attention to and maybe we'll find out you know, what, what direction they're going with it after the fact, and we can contrast and compare the movie with the, the original story. So at any rate, if you did like the video, please do give it a thumbs up and share it around. You can follow me on Twitter for some occasional Tolkien-related trivia. You can subscribe to the channel here. You can support the channel here, and you can find two of my previous videos here. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namariye.